Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Ian Bremmer, founder and president of Eurasia Group, um, a man who has spent much of his life looking at political risk. I can't think of a better person to speak to right now, Ian, as we're looking at what's happening in Israel um, with the risks of a ground war. There have been some brief incursions. How are you seeing this situation in terms of the risk scenarios for Israel and beyond? I wish they wouldn't do it, uh, but they're going to. Uh, and I think that that actually describes the perspective of just about everyone outside Israel at this point. Um, the response from the Israeli government, and I'm talking about the war cabinet here, so these are experienced people. This is not the far right wing coalition of Netanyahu that's making the war decisions. But, but these decisions are being made emotionally more than strategically. Um, you know, you have to understand that everyone in Israel has had their lives changed uh, in ways that are pretty unfathomable. Everybody mm -hmm. knows someone personally who has been killed um, in uh, in these terror attacks. 360,000 people have been mobilized, young men and women. That's 4% of the entire population mobilized for war. Uh, I, I mean, you know, they, they're constantly, even the conversations you have with Israeli leaders are, are continually being interrupted by air raid sirens, uh, and then they have to go into the safe rooms, so too when they're sleeping at night. So, I mean, this is not a normal decision-making process, um, and so I, I try to be more understanding of what they're going through, but I mean, the reality is that after two weeks of, uh, of, of extraordinary bombing campaign, which has done a lot of damage to Hamas uh, infrastructure uh, and has done a lot more damage to Palestinian civilians, uh, they are still very much planning an imminent ground campaign. I, I don't think there's anything that's going to stop them. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the implications of that for the long term for Israel and for the region are going to be very negative indeed. So let's talk about those implications. I mean, let's even start with the fact of what does success look like? This is more of a, a war of ideas than it is, you know, war of armies when you're look, dealing with Hamas. In what way would there be success for them in this scenario? You can't beat an idea. Uh, the Americans understood that eventually, but it took us a long time. That's why Biden talked about the war on terror and implored the Israeli government not to repeat the mistakes of the United States. Remember, we, we went to war against an idea. We defeated Al Qaeda as an organization. Um, and uh, bin Laden was was killed um, and, and his uh, senior um, colleagues, fellow terrorists, um, were either imprisoned or were blown up. Mm -hmm. Al Qaeda as an organization really is no longer functional as it had been. But the U.S. didn't just go to war against Al Qaeda. The U.S. went to war on terror. And that meant uh, that uh, a lot of liberties, personal liberties in the United States were rolled back, particularly if you were a Muslim American and you were targeted. Uh, as a potential terrorist. Uh, you were screened as a potential terrorist uh, for years after 9-11, um, unfairly and, and not true to the ideals of the country and the Constitution. Um, the United States spent trillions of dollars uh, on a war on terror uh, that still today uh, affects us in the way we govern, uh, in the way we uh, think about homeland security, uh, the way we think about personal security. Uh, and then, of course, you have the war on terror outside the United States, which led to decades of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan and failed wars with uh, millions of lives uh, that were uh, destroyed uh, yeah. on, on the back of that. Now, um, I, I say all of that, uh, which has very little to do with what Hamas did on October 7th, um, but you know, Israel is saying they're going to war against Hamas. They're not talking about a war on terror, but but what they are doing uh, is is really following in the footsteps of the United States. Um, and certainly, if you saw Netanyahu and his speech 
you know, we are the people of light, they are the people of darkness. Now, of course, what Netanyahu would say is he's just talking about Hamas, the terror organization, but there are no Palestinians that would view it that way. Yeah. Certainly not after um, the, the siege of Gaza, which breaks international law um, by Israel, certainly not after the, the weeks of bombing, um, not after the demand um, that everybody in the north leave and evacuate when there were no places for them to go, no supplies awaiting them, no encampments ready for them. I mean, you know, all, all of this um, is seen by the Palestinians um, as uh, uh, someone who wants the Gaza rid of them. Um, and and that will lead to more radicalization because, of course, the Palestinians aren't going anywhere. And ultimately, you can't resolve this militarily. You mm -hmm. have to resolve this diplomatically. But it's not like you can have that conversation today with either the Israeli government uh, or with the Palestinian Authority, which you know doesn't control even most of the West Bank. And in Gaza, if you destroy Hamas, as you should, uh, you know, it's unclear who's going to govern it, what their ideology will be, and to what extent they'll potentially be effective. We're we're so far from that. Yeah. So uh, that you know, it's it's. I wish this were an easier conversation. Of course, on on social media, it's a very easy conversation because all you need to do is figure out whether you prefer the Jews or the Palestinians, and then you just say everything from that perspective. That's it's very easy, but it doesn't in any way reflect reality on the ground. Yeah. Um, and and as long as you continue with that, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed that the violence will get worse. Well, I mean, and, and obviously we've seen the demonstrations here and the consequences have been, you know, just horrific and emotional on all sides. But you t right now we're talking about a two front war. And as, in essence, you know, what are the risks of a wider regional conflict? Obviously, people are looking at Hezbollah, Lebanon. They're looking at Iran, wondering if Iran is trying to goad, you know, those two groups into a war with Israel. Um, what do you see as the wider consequences if this progresses? So right now, I guess one of the pieces of good news, if you can call it that, is that almost all of the fighting um, is inside the borders of Gaza. And, and no one is getting in or out of Gaza at this point. A limited amount of humanitarian supplies have made their way literally dozens of trucks, that's it, uh, through the crossing, the land crossing uh, in the south on Egypt. Uh, but that's it. Um, now, there are um, about 70 that we know of, I believe, um, Palestinian uh, deaths so far, civilian deaths um, in the West Bank. There's been more violence there, uh, some violence on settlers, some settler violence on Palestinians, a lot of IDF um, violence uh, against Palestinians, some efforts to uh, take out would-be terrorists and radicals. Uh, the, the first place that you would expect the war to expand as we move towards a ground campaign and as more and more Palestinians are killed would be in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And that can manifest both in terms of greater levels of violence um, and it can also manifest in terms of undermining and potentially overturning Fatah, the Palestinian Authority, which unlike Hamas does recognize uh, Israel's right to govern and exist, um, is not a terrorist organization and has been trying to engage in constructive uh, diplomacy both with the Israelis and with other countries in the region. Um, more broadly, uh, now, now, by the way, I, I, I put that in its own bucket because no matter how bad the West Bank gets, the Americans are not going to get involved in that war. So mm -hmm. as long as it is the occupied territories that we're talking about, and, and here we mean Gaza and the West Bank, lots of violence can get very much worse in terms of radicalization, destroying you know, any prospect for peace for decades, but it's not a broader war outside of Israel and Palestine. Now, more broadly, um, when you talk about a proxy war, 
we have already had, I think, 24 American servicemen and women have been injured on a base in Syria. And there have been a mm. lot of drone strikes against American bases there in Iraq, as well as uh, ships um, in, uh, in, out, off of Yemen. Um, the Houthis, uh, a, a Shia group in Yemen, Hezbollah, Shia in Lebanon, uh, Shia militants in Iraq, um, have all been involved in limited skirmishing and rocket attacks against Israel and against American troops in the region. And indeed, one of the reasons why the Israelis have delayed their ground invasion, which again, I expect is virtually 100% imminent, um, is because the United States has told Israel that they want more time to get defensive measures in place because they fully expect that all sorts of folks are going to be trying to blow up Americans on the ground in the region. Now, at the same time, the U.S. has sent a lot more troops, a lot more materiel into the region, most notably two aircraft carrier strike groups to the Eastern Med. And along with that, they have sent a direct message to Iran, which is we will, we the Americans, will get involved directly if you involve yourselves in the war. Um, is that likely? Would, would Iran actually get involved? Is it at the appetite to fight a direct war? I think the answer to that is no, in part because they need the money that comes from producing and exporting oil, in part because they've been engaging with the Saudis uh, constructively over the past two weeks at a very high level, um, in part because they have um, the statements that they've made um, and the intelligence that has been gathered implies that they don't want to be directly a part of the war, but they are involved in the war. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have been training Hamas. They have been funding Hamas. They've provided them with military support. So, uh, and, and the, the people that have been involved in strikes against U.S. forces in the region are proxies of Iran. So this is, this is very different from Russia, Ukraine, where everyone on the NATO side has said, look, we're gonna help Ukraine, but we don't wanna be involved in this fighting directly at all. And, and on the Russian side, the Russians are making those decisions in a singular way. So, I mean, you've had a couple of Polish citizens get killed when a rocket, you know, sort of hit just the Ukrainian border. The Ukrainians then send up air defense. But that was a mistake. They've been very, very careful in 20 months of fighting not to get NATO involved. We've had two weeks of fighting. We haven't even started a ground campaign yet. The Americans are already involved. Right? Yeah. And, and yeah. the Americans have made very clear that they will get much more involved. Uh, that is that is a statement of fact. Um, if if Hezbollah opens a broad front in the north, or if Iranian proxy fighting, you know, sort of evolves into something that looks like a regular fight. So I, I fear I don't think that we are close to a direct war with Iran, but I think we're very close to the Americans getting directly and routinely involved in this fighting. And, and this brings another very important difference with Russia-Ukraine, which is that in the Russia-Ukraine war, the United States has been completely uh, coordinated with all of its NATO allies. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the same basic policy. On this front, the United States will support an Israel ground war. Privately, they are. They don't want them to do it. They've been trying to delay it, but they will support it publicly. Almost no U.S. allies will support a ground war. Who will? Um, France? I mean, there's a few players, right? Are there, um, I don't even know. Is it fair to say France would support it? I don't know. You know, I, I will tell you that Macron, you know, just made a trip to Israel and he made some strong statements in favor of Israel, but also in favor of uh, trying to stabilize this situation. Yeah. And I know from talking to French officials that if the ground war had started before Macron uh, made that trip, he was not going to go to Israel. So that that certainly implies that the French position is at best soft on this issue. And, and I fully expect that many European governments would proactively oppose a, a ground war. And pretty much everyone else 
uh, the so-called global south, would fully oppose a ground war where, where the majority, the vast majority of countries in the world um, actually strongly uh, uh, condemned the illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine. You're about to have a General Assembly conversation on Israel-Palestine, and the General Assembly is going to condemn Israel. Uh, that that's very clear. And the General Assembly is is generally very opposed to Israel. They they you know often you know take opportunities to you know single out Israel for human rights abuses, and they they they, they very rarely have anything to say about an organization like Hamas. Um, but it's not like the General Assembly is this organization that is out there that people should say, oh, we don't like them. The General Assembly is all the governments of the world, right? That's what it is. So this is this is a problem for the U.S. This is a problem for Biden. This is this is the Americans engaging themselves in a deeply, deeply unpopular um, yeah. war. On, on a side that is likely to be viewed as deeply problematic by the vast majority of the world's governments, including the vast majority of the world's democracies. This is, this, again, this is not like you're fighting against Russia, Iran, North Korea, and Belarus. Like, it's easy to stand for Ukraine. It's very hard to stand for Israel. Yeah, I mean, it's you've even seen this generational divide. I don't know if that's fair in the U.S. with the sort of pro-Palestine, you know, demonstrations which a lot of people have equated with anti-semitism i don't know do you think that's a fair analogy to be seeing those um in essence anti-israel protests as being a hallmark of anti-semitism because that's how it's certainly being interpreted i think a lot of the anti-israel protests on campuses in the u.s that i've seen have been anti-semitic absolutely i would say that um, I see that the anti-Semitic attacks in the United States are up massively since October 7th. Also, anti-Muslim and Islamophobic attacks are up massively since October 7th. If you want to look at the comparable numbers, they're worse on the anti-Semitic side than the Islamophobic side. But, but the direction of travel is really, really bad on both sides. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is true that Generation Z um, is much more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, much more sympathetic to the civilians of Gaza um, than older Americans who are much more sympathetic to, uh, to the Jewish cause as well as to Israel. And those two things are, of course, different. But yep. I also want to say that for those who would broad brush any support for Palestinians as support for Hamas, that's insane. Um, there is that, but that's a very small percentage of what we're actually seeing. Unfortunately, it's a very high percentage of what is promoted on social media. And that is intentional, it is performative, it is part of the business model, particularly for Twitter X, it is what Elon is doing. Um, and, and that, of course, is deeply damaging to civil society in the United States. Yeah, we've also seen on X a lot of the very graphic images. You know, this is the first time I've seen terrorists where all of them seem to have GoPro cams yep. as they're carrying out these assaults. Before we leave the region, um, Ian, I want to ask, you know, we've talked in the past about the Abraham Accords and this whole move to create regional stability, prosperity. You know, Saudi Arabia has been a linchpin player here. What are you seeing at least some grumblings of support for a continuation of that and does a ground war impact the prospects for continued ties for israel at, at, at best it freezes what had been very positive development um in in normalizing relations with israel across the region at best um in reality uh it will make it worse uh these governments particularly the authoritarian leaders in the gulf uh, Egypt are actually, Jordan, are actually pragmatic when it comes to wanting more investment trade tourism with Israel from Israel. Um, but, but the people of these countries are, are outraged and will be more so. Uh, and the Arab street will matter in that regard. So certainly 
as long as there's a war going on and as long as Netanyahu is driving it, it's inconceivable that we would have a Saudi breakthrough with the Israelis. That was yeah. imminent. That was within months before the war happened. But again, I, I hold these governments as complicit. I don't just blame Israel for the state of the Palestinians. I also blame all of the countries that were more than happy to just talk about how to stabilize the region while the situation for the Palestinians was getting worse and they weren't they weren't doing anything to fix it. Um, like so Qatar? That, that's a reality. I also yeah. blame the Palestinians who have had incredibly corrupt governance that has not supported their own people. Uh, that includes Fatah in the West Bank, but certainly, you know, Hamas. I mean, you think about how just how much money has gone into their military capabilities over the past years, as opposed to trying to make life livable for Palestinians living in Gaza. Uh, yeah. And that's unconscionable. So, I mean, there's just such a long list of people that have screwed the average Palestinian over the last 10, 20 years. And that, that is what we are now dealing with. Yeah. Let me switch, if I can, to the U.S., because I'd be remiss not to ask you about, sure. we finally have a speaker, you know, Mike Johnson, Louisiana Republican election denier. I'm trying, I, I could go down the list. What do you make of, of that? I mean, uh, I don't even know where to start, but we finally have at least a speaker in place. How's the rest of the world viewing our shenanigans in Washington. Uh, well, first of all, connecting it to the Middle East, of course, he's very, very strong on the right in terms of the Israel issue, both in the United States and, of course, even more so globally. And the fact that that was like the first piece of legislation they wanted to push was show strong support for Israel. And I don't know who's going to talk about Ukraine in that environment. That's a that's a very big deal. You and I are talking, no questions on Ukraine. Two weeks, no one's asking me questions on Ukraine. That's kind of the state of play. It was the most important issue for 20 months. So there's that. Um, having said that, uh, let's be clear that uh, he has a pretty centrist voting record. He's a median conservative member um, mm -hmm. in the caucus. Uh, his voting record is slightly to the right of McCarthy, but well to the left of Jim Jordan. So he's roughly in line with majority leader and fellow Louisiana, and by the way, uh, Steve Scalise. I think yep. that's important. Um, and I, I don't think, I mean, he's not very well known, but for the purpose of legislating, it doesn't really matter who the speaker is. It only matters that they come into the position with a clear backing from the conference and credibility with both far right and moderates to survive floating compromise positions, particularly on funding. And for now, Mike Johnson has that. So I think that's what's really relevant here. Certainly for Democrats, they're going to focus on the fact that he's aligned with the far right on some of the most high profile voting issues, like his objection to the 2020 election results and some of the statements that he's made on same sex marriage on abortion, which will be, of course, a core component of the Democrats 2024 campaign messaging, but isn't going to really matter very much. So what you've been hearing again on social media is not really relevant to what people around the world are seeing. Have you changed your views of um, sort of the election prospects? Biden certainly, no. Just, nope, not uh, at all. Um, anything else on your radar, Ian, you want to put on ours? I mean, you mentioned Russia. I know there's Ukraine. been reports of We've Hamas. Got to talk about you know? I, mean, I don't have time, unfortunately, today, yep, but we will but the next time you do we it. Should. I would say specifically, um, that, uh, you know, the, the United States is increasingly challenged in supporting what all the Europeans want, which is more military support for Ukraine, allowing them to take more of their territory back. That now looks increasingly very distant as a prospect, which means one way or the other, the Russians probably maintain a grip on the 18 percent of territory they presently hold. And that is unacceptable to the Ukrainians, the Europeans and and to President Biden. So somehow you're going to have to square that circle. We are going to need to talk about that. Okay. To be continued. Thanks yeah. for joining us, Ian. Good stuff. See you soon. Thanks.